Hey, it's Mike here, and today, why vegan diets don't work, debunked by popular request from you guys. But will cutting animal foods out of our diet really improve health? Yes, the large YouTube channel, What I've Learned, has made another pro meat video. This is, you know, maybe number four or five or six. I've responded to several of them over the years. He has two million subscribers who just eat this stuff up. They slurp it up like that animal fat that he loves to promote. You know, he's denied the carcinogenic properties of meats. He's denied the environmental benefits of plant-based diet and on and on. And now he's gone and made essentially a 40 minute documentary directly going after vegan diets for the first time. There's some main attacks which range from, you know, plants are the reason that we have crooked teeth to a bunch about vitamins and beyond. And he's generally relying on outdated studies or, you know, ignoring things in the studies that he is citing, as you'll see, making major logical leaps, all with a nice zest of fear mongering. Okay, let's get into it. The main thesis of his video is really that a vegan diet does not work because it is not healthy. So he of course leaves out a lot of evidence that it is working, you know, how over and over again, vegans are shown to have lower levels of chronic diseases, you know, lower levels of cancer, absurdly lower diabetes and hypertension or high blood pressure risk, lower obesity, they have lower inflammation, lower thyroid disease. Heck, even loosely plant-based dieters had 73% lower risk of moderate to severe COVID cases, while low carbers, which is a narrative he is pushing, had about four times the risk of those bad COVID cases. And of course, vegan interventions have shown incredible benefits for cardiovascular disease, looking to the work of Dr. Esselstyn. And in terms of mortality, vegans are at least trending at dying less by about 15%, though we need more data to make that statistically significant, but certainly not trending toward higher mortality, which would be less healthy, unlike low carb diets, which I will just come right out and say multiple meta-analysis have shown a 30% increase in all-cause mortality. You know, with those high meat, low carb diets, though plant-based low carb diets, lower mortality association. Anyway, that's just a couple ways that a vegan diet does work. Let's get into what he says. In this video, I'd like to tell you the story behind why I think plant-based is not the best direction to head in. Yeah, he doesn't even want people to be eating more plants and no crap, that's what he thinks. It's very obvious from his videos, despite his neutral seeming tone, which isn't fooling anybody. Actually, I think it's fooling about 2 million people. Brooklyn, we will be instituting Meatless Monday. Plant-based at Bellevue Hospital. He shows a sort of montage about calls to reduce meat consumption. And in there, you can see New York City Mayor Eric Adams, who on a vegan diet reversed severe diabetes, a vegan diet cleared up his diabetic vision and nerve issues. And I just wanted to throw out an anecdote there because he goes hard into the fear mongering anecdotes. And that's just one of the many positive ones. But if eating zero animal foods improves health so much, why would a 2016 study find that 84% of vegans eventually quit their diet? Okay, if exercise isn't bad for you, then how come 80% of people fail their New Year's resolutions, which include exercise? If they fail, it has to be bad for you, according to his logic. That's it, exercise is unhealthy. Anyway, to that study, which was actually 2014, not 2016, it's the case that 84% of vegetarians and vegans combined lapsed on their diet but looking at vegan specifically, it was 70%, just had to clear up that detail, little mistake. He then goes through a montage of ex-vegan videos and he even got the very recent Cosmic Skeptic video in there. I found it very difficult to maintain a healthy plant-based diet. I'm not vegan anymore. And Cosmic Skeptic did state that he was afraid that his video is gonna be used against veganism. Looks like it already is. Every nutrient that you need to be healthy can be found in an adequately planned plant-based diet. And I responded to virtually all of those YouTube ex-vegan cases in previous videos. Largely, they omit blood work and they have a lot of conflicting, inconsistent details. So you can watch my videos on those. I'll link them below. But now this is where we're only like one minute into his literal documentary. So let's speed things up here, starting with the whole crooked teeth thing. Here he is. Dr. Weston A. Price set off on a 10-year journey, traveling to 14 different countries in search of people who naturally had excellent teeth. Yes, he starts off with the king of anecdotal observations, Weston A. Price, who, yeah, didn't even believe that bacteria caused cavities or that brushing your teeth would prevent cavities. A crappy dentist. Full video on him linked below. He found a clear pattern. Those living on their traditional diet were in good health, had broad dental arches, straight teeth, and very few cavities. However, other groups in the same area who started eating these new modern foods 
developed crooked teeth. He then points to an increase in plant foods like refined sugars and oils. And we know that refined sugars are bad for your teeth, but they do not equal vegan diet. Across all the groups he studied, the foods they prized most were nutrient dense animal foods. To summarize, he then says that the traditionally eaten animal product vitamins were actually what allowed people to form proper jaw structure and have enough room for their teeth. But by this logic, as these people switch to a more modern diet, wouldn't their bones also have malformations all over their body? Like, wouldn't they have crooked, rickets-like legs because they didn't have enough vitamins to form proper bone structure? They didn't. But what I don't think he looked at is what modern scientists actually have to say about why our teeth got crooked and jaws got smaller. One example is this 2020 paper in Oxford Academics Bioscience Journal mentioning that based on previous research, the effect of loading bone with heavier mastication or chewing appears to directly affect the density and size of these facial structures and that food consistency determines facial development, suggesting that a diet with harder textures enhances bone and muscle growth. We also have dental anthropologist Robert Coraccini, who essentially puts it like this. You have a set amount of teeth. They're at a certain size and they're expecting your mouth to get a certain amount of mechanical stress, a certain amount of workout, which will increase the general size of it and your teeth will be able to fit. Then of course, as we ate softer foods, our jaws weren't growing as big and we didn't have room for our teeth. And he actually did, you know, I don't like animal studies, but he did some very compelling monkey studies. He took 40 monkeys and then he randomized them into two groups. The first group had a hard biscuit that they were given and the second one had a water softened biscuit. We're talking about the same nutrition, but different jaw workouts. He then looked at dental abnormalities and the hard biscuit group had even less abnormalities than monkeys on their natural diet. And the soft biscuits of course had more abnormalities. The study concludes, quote, animals raised on soft foods show more rotated and displaced teeth, crowded premolars, and absolutely and relatively narrower dental arches. Yes, the dental arches that Weston A. Price was obsessed with. And for what it's worth, it's been replicated in rats and pigs as well. And in other words, ironically, stopping eating tough, fibrous plant foods would lower the amount of mechanical stress on the jaw and shrink the jaw as well. And that's, of course, what we saw as more refined foods were put in. And this is much like how modern thick soled shoes collapse our arches or how bone development in space is horrible because you don't have that mechanical stress we've evolved for millions of years to have. So no, this is not a vitamin issue. Heck, you could have a Weston A. Price Foundation fantasy and feed people a bunch of raw dairy products and liver, give them a ton of those vitamins that he's talking about, and they would still end up with poor jaw structure and crooked teeth. And now for today's sponsor, Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic, which has probiotics and prebiotics that feed the probiotics. And today we're talking about how not all all probiotics are created equal. Most probiotics are developed by supplement companies that make a ton of different products. It's not their specialty. And from the NIH, a lot of probiotics are sold as supplements, which don't require FDA approval before they are marketed. I Seed is different because they are a microbiome science company that then decided to create a probiotic. And that is evidenced by some of their board members, publishing research in the field in top scientific journals. And their attention to detail and quality, they have over 50 quality assurance and quality control checkpoints, talking about potency with that 53.6 billion active cell units of bacteria, survivability with their Viacap that they have created that allows the bacteria to survive through your system. They also check for contaminants like heavy metals and pesticides and do an allergen panel. And they've even done extensive thermostability testing. And the result is that you don't need to refrigerate it, unlike some other probiotics. And they have 24 specific strains, while other companies don't even share their specific strains oftentimes. They have a ton of research as to why their product can support you in terms of digestive health, gut immunity, gut barrier, skin health, cardiovascular health, and more. And I will just say that Lindy and I have been taking this since 2021, and we are doing great digestively and love taking it. So if you wanna try this little green guy, you can click the link below and use the code Mike. 15 at checkout for 15% off your first month's supply of Seed's Daily Symbiotic. Thank you very much, Seed. He then talks about how milk helps people grow taller and calcium blurdy blur. A study of 105 countries in the Journal of Economics and Human Biology noted that animal food, particularly dairy, 
most correlated with increases in height. Quick reminder that 70% of planet Earth is lactose intolerant. Do they just not work as human beings because they can't drink your little cow excretions, huh? <laughs> anyway, this sounds nice, ooh, tall milk, but the result is likely due to IGF-1 and how dairy raises it because it has IGF-1 and stimulates IGF-1 production as well. IGF-1 fuels every stage of cancer growth and spreading and high IGF-1 means more height and height is unfortunately associated with more cancer cancer across the board, really. As this paper states, the association between taller stature and higher risk of many cancers is remarkably robust. You know, they say it's pretty much across the board, pointing to IGF-1 as it, quote, directly affects cancer risk as well as increasing height. It's probably why this study on 9,000 men found that drinking milk every day in adolescence led to a 320% risk of getting prostate cancer. He goes on to make the case for why we can't just replace meat with plants, and he brings out a blast from the past, Ravana, here she is. Because my blood tests were always like a little bit low. I would go anywhere with like a big bag of supplements. My heart- I have an entire like 20 minute video response on her story and her quitting and just right off the bat, her timeline involved, first of all, being a raw vegan, which can make it a little bit harder to get certain nutrients. And then also did things like a 25 day water only fast, you know, not a great way to get nutrients either. She also didn't go into particular deficiencies when she quit. So I'm wondering where these low levels are coming in at, you know, was it actually deficient or is she just saying she was low? What were the nutrients? And also just to make anecdotal claims, cause he's bringing one in here. Like the videos that he flashed of her when she were vegan were just so much more energetic and vibrant than her now. I don't know, it might just be her mood. Not selling the energy aspect of quitting a vegan diet anyway, he gets onto vitamins, vitamin A. And the conversion rate is very poor, about 12 to one. Actually, it's closer to 21 to one because the fiber in plants makes it harder to absorb. Yeah, he talks about something most of you already know that beta carotene in plants needs to be converted to vitamin A. Further, depending on your genes, your conversion rate could be even lower. This is the case for me and for potentially as many as 37% of people of European descent. And he says that he has the lower conversion gene. It shows about 32% lower in his screenshot. However, this doesn't really matter because plant beta carotene levels are so high. Yeah, just 200 calories of sweet potato has more than enough retinol equivalents for him to convert at like 160% of his daily value. And those retinol equivalents really requirements were determined using European populations. And in that sense, lower conversion was taken into account. And from the EU, quote, vitamin A requirements can be met by any mixture of preformed vitamin A and pro-vitamin A carotenoids. That provides an amount of vitamin A equivalent to the reference value. So just carotenoids alone does it. And the 2021 study found vegan Finnish children to have insufficient vitamin A. The fear mongering continues. He mentioned studies with vegans with lower vitamin A, like, oh my gosh, this one on some daycare kids, oh my gosh. And he actually highlights what I view as an inaccurate statement by the authors, because if you actually look at their vitamin A chart, no vegans are actually below the reference line, which is arbitrary units. Only one meat eating kid was under it. Also, this was just six vegans, and weirdly, they were eating a RAE, which is, you know, retinol equivalent to just half a carrot a day, which just seems weirdly low for vegans, throwing that out there. But what was actually disturbing about this study was the ridiculously high cholesterol levels and really low folate levels of these meat eating kids. You know, LDL or bad cholesterol is the most important metric here. It is causally linked to atherosclerosis. I mean, just pause to read this chart and the amount of trials they have on there. It's undeniable. Heart disease is our leading killer. And 30% of those kids that were eating meat had LDL levels that were too high, which is ridiculous. And a 2020 German study found vegans to have a lower vitamin A level than omnivores. What was that scary lower level that these German vegans had for vitamin A? Well, 2.1 was the meat eaters and the vegans were at 1.8. Oh my gosh, vitamin, ah, that was a really bad joke. You can stop watching. And in the context of Europeans, there are also other European vegan studies like this one out of Switzerland. You'd assume that lower conversion and there was no statistically significant difference between vitamin A deficiency rates. Vitamin D is only found in animal foods with some exceptions like mushrooms and some algae. And a 2016 Finnish study found vegans level vitamin D to be 34% lower than omnivores. Yeah, for some reason, the vegans in those studies ate one third as many berries as the meat eaters. I don't know what they were up to, but it's very clear that vitamin D is not a vegan specific problem. Looking to this paper, yeah, about 1 billion people, 1 billion people on earth are vitamin 
D deficient, and half of them are insufficient? That's just insane, obviously half of the world is not vegan, so not a specific problem. And here's another example of him not reading through all the studies he mentions, because from that German study we just talked about, the vegan vitamin D levels actually trended slightly higher than the meat eaters, though it wasn't statistically significant. Funny that he didn't mention that. And why not hammer at home? Here's another German, you know, Northern Latitude vitamin D study, where their levels were the same for vegans. And yeah, compare multiple groups, one group's probably gonna be higher or lower, some vegan studies will be lower, but there are things, of course, you can do to solve this. And I always love talking about vitamin D mushrooms that have UV exposure. And he actually mentions them later on as some like crazy impractical thing that you would have to do. Of course you don't. But I just think it's funny because people are so focused on getting dairy for things like vitamin D when in the US, a lot of dairy has added vitamin D supplementation given to them. So a lot of people are getting synthetic vitamin D anyway. It's just the way society is set up. The richest sources of K2 are going to be animal livers, especially goose liver egg yolks, hard cheese, and full fat dairy. Now, do vegans suffer from the negatives of vitamin K2? Well, the main one is like blood clotting and vegans obviously, as I've shown over and over again, do great in terms of cardiovascular health. And as he admits, you can just eat fermented foods, which are part of a vegan diet. This is not how a vegan diet doesn't work. Not, not, a lot of negatives. The fermented soybean dish natto does in fact have a ton of K2 and sauerkraut has some too. And also on the topic of K, that German study also found that vitamin K1 levels in vegans were like twice as high as the meat eaters. So clearly again, a meat eating diet does not work. Meat eaters just gonna have to run for the hills and plant some lettuce on that hill. But since vitamin K2 also has a role in bones, he points to a study showing vegans having weaker bones. Speaking of all these nutrients good for the skeleton, a 2021 Polish study found vegan children to have weaker bones and were three centimeters shorter than their meat eating counterparts. He loves to mention this one. He's mentioned it before. I responded to it before and he always skips over the first sentence of the conclusion, which is that the vegans had a better cardiovascular profile. Again, our leading killer, but what is going on here in terms of, let's start with that height. Oh, so scary. One explanation here is that meat and dairy are linked to a accelerated puberty, earlier puberty due to various hormonal effects. From the study, quote, several components of dairy have been linked to earlier menarche, which is girls' first period. And from this 2010 study of 3,000 girls eating a high meat diet at age seven, results in a 75% increased likelihood of having their first period at 12 or younger. And we have another study that corroborates that, yes, higher red meat associated with earlier first period. And this 2020 study highlights something really interesting that an earlier puberty shifts the growth chart earlier, looking to, <clears throat> you know, with respect to the five to 10 year olds that were mentioned in the study he talks about, by age 10, you can already see a 10 centimeter difference between early and late bloomers. Again, the study found a three centimeter difference. Ironically, the early bloomers end up at a smaller total height while the late bloomers end up normal height. Also, I do remember I was a bit of a late bloomer. I didn't eat that much meat growing up and I had friends that went through puberty earlier and they were taller than me for a good period of time and then I ended up taller than them in the end. And also really importantly, early puberty is not healthy and is associated with a variety of diseases like breast and endometrial cancer as well as obesity and looking to men in particular. From this 2020 Nature study, early puberty in boys means nine months shorter lifespan. So yeah, you can just see he's not giving the whole picture here. And oh, that bone density thing seems kind of scary. And as for bones, the end result was like three to 5% difference in bone density, depending on you know what part of the body you're looking at. And it is adjusted. The BMI was lower for the vegans. And when things are adjusted, things can be sort of fudged a bit, but it's just not that much of a difference compared to say the 72% low lower inflammation markers that the vegans had compared to the meat eaters. I do think vegans need to focus on bone health. And as I will talk about later, no diet is perfect, but you can't just outright ignore stuff like that when you cite a study, that's insane. Most vegans know they need to supplement B12, which is very important for brain function. Yet one study looking at B12 status in vegetarians and vegans found that 7% of vegetarians and 52% of vegans were not getting enough B12. Now he gets into B12, and of course he cites an old ass study that recruited in the 90s being like, vegans have more B12 deficiency, completely ignoring the slew of recent studies that over and over and over and over again show that vegans do not have increased risk of B12 deficiency. However, in another study with a more sensitive testing method, they found a whopping 77% of vegetarians 
and 92% of vegans had insufficient B12, whereas only 11% of omnivores did. And yes, of course, he chooses another one from a couple decades ago, being like, they're choosing such sensitive markers here. Well, it just shows how he's a little crooked here because a study that he cited from 2020, yes, that same German one, used a lot of those sensitive markers and found no difference in B12. In fact, the vegans trended at about 20% higher B12 level. You know, their total B12 index for CB12, which includes hollow transcobalamine and methylmalonic acid, trended higher as well for vegans. He's a cabalamini to the animals, mean. Anyway, moving on to what I consider a very, again, fear-mongering and pseudoscientific claim around B12 he makes twice. Perhaps the B12 supplements don't work exactly like animal foods do. A B12 supplement might not work quite the same as animal-derived B12. Nope, over and over and over again, studies on B12 supplements show that it raises these sensitive markers, these more in-depth markers like methylmalonic acid. This is just completely unfounded. Heck, some animals, a lot of cats Cattle are given B12 supplements and then people get that through the meat. Uh, yeah, it's the same on so many levels. He says vegans might just not be able to absorb it because of their fiber and other reasons. Well, heck, this study just gave 50 micrograms a day for vegans and vegetarians who are on the lower end, and just that was enough to raise their status using all of those advanced B12 markers in all subjects. Total BS. He then highlights some scary sounding B12 vegan stories. Well, guess what? There are some scary B12 related stories for people who are not vegan as well. That's anecdotal. But again, looking to these recent studies, we are seeing that that vegans have B12 on lock. Next, we get to the gut stuff. He does a rapid fire X vegan video montage of people with bloating. Poor digestion. Hurting my stomach. Stomach bloating. Bloated. Bloated a lot. Bloating. Bloated. I wonder why he doesn't include X vegan Nikocado avocado as his example of people that are doing better off a vegan diet. I don't know. You know, he quotes John Venus saying that digestive problems are normalized on a- I think as many vegans normalize bad digestion. It's just something that you kind of like normalize when you're vegan. Thankfully, I don't have digestive issues on a vegan diet, but we really cannot pretend like digestive issues are vegan specific. From a survey of 70,000 Americans, 60% reported having at least one GI system like bloating in the last week, almost a third had heartburn. 20% had diarrhea. I didn't know that 60% of the US was vegan. But simply eating too much fiber could be a culprit. He points to high fiber as the problem, and it actually always surprises me how vegans from these studies, some ones that he cited, only see like a 25% increase in fiber consumption. It varies depending on the place, but it's not that crazy different. And for people who are going super high fiber, yeah, maybe they have a compromised biome and they need to work through that with different types of fiber, ramping fiber up, working with a gastroenterologist like Angie Sadeghi. But the gut biome of vegans from this study is generally associated with an increased amount of benefit and a decreased amount of potentially pathogenic gut bacteria. But as this paper highlights, 97% of the US is fiber deficient, and that leads to a variety of issues like constipation, as well as diverticulitis, which is these little pockets that form in the colon and hemorrhoids, not good stuff. And to just strike down all that fiber fear mongering from this meta-analysis on fiber and mortality, quote, a higher dietary fiber intake was associated with a reduced risk of death. Be afraid of fiber though. And I once again, think it's good to cite something that he cited to prove him wrong, or at least show that he's exaggerating here. Yeah, digestive issues exist on a vegan diet. Some people quit because of them, but how many, looking to that phonolytic study, we can see that even health in general is not the reason that 80% of veg people quit, with the study saying, it is quite noteworthy that such a small proportion of individuals experienced ill health, and they even emphasize that reasons for quitting a vegan diet can be exaggerated to justify the quitting. However, it is the case that 63% of people who quit said they disliked that their veg diet made them stick out from the crowd. So as he briefly mentions, yes, social is a factor. It's a major factor, but moving on, he goes to the sort of appeal to nature. Hey, we ate meat during our ancestral times, so blah -de blah Why should we assume a meat-containing diet was the natural default for humans rather than a plant-based diet? 
Well, I think this topic is interesting. I still think that we should be looking forward in terms of what we should eat, you know, what is the best, not just for our health, but also for our planet and society. You know, we're already doing so many things differently than we did in the past. If we can change our diet so that it improves upon what we ate in the past, that's better. But going beyond that, I also think there's a strong case for how we had a way more herbivorous diet than he paints it as. I have several videos on that. Anthropologist Karen Hardy and her team point to starchy, plants as the fuel that allowed us to grow such a large brain. And heck, Weston A. Price, if you want to talk about jaw structure, look at this. Carnivores can't do this. It's called mastication. Not to be confused with an M word. He literally says that traditionally people ate few plant foods just across the whole world. Like, that's just it. The people eating the traditional diets did eat a few plant foods, but they just weren't nearly as important to them as the animal foods. This is just rewriting history. We can look around the world at cultures like the Taro Umaro, who were recorded traditionally eating about 97% of calories from plants. Or I could once again use what he cited to show that he is wrong. Even Weston A. Price, through his very clouded goggles, still made observations such as these in the same book that he was citing. In Peru, ancient cultures were growing large quantities of corns, beans, squash, and other plants, you know, to Australia assortment of plant roots and fruits. Now, taro was an important factor in the Torres Strait Islands. Taro, banana, papaya, and plums are all grown abundantly to Amazon tribes. They use very large quantities of yucca, starchy root, quite similar to potatoes. And heck, even to the traditional Swiss, of course, they're having dairy, but also rye bread in connection with plant foods and meat only once a week. We also have Uganda's bananas and sweet potatoes in the Garden of Eden, they call it. You know, and from a study like this, we've been eating grains for over 100,000 years. And at one point he even says like, oh, no unbred fruit from the past was sweeter than a carrot is. Well, guess what was in this Neanderthal's fossilized dental plaque? Dates. Yeah, that stuff is sweet as heck. Anyway, moving on, he also has a little saturated fat denial section. You gotta throw that in there. Here he is. Cheese and bacon still have saturated fat, so you wanna limit them. Cut back on saturated fat. A huge 2020 review explained that saturated fat-rich foods like whole fat dairy or unprocessed meat themselves are not associated with an increased risk of heart disease. Then if it isn't the saturated fat, why are all these studies that he cited showing that the non-vegans had really high levels of LDL, AKA bad cholesterol, again, causally linked to atherosclerosis, just out of thin air? What is it? Oh, it's because the study that he cites is authored by various dairy industry connected people, like the name I see a lot, Ronald Krauss, then further reviewing other dairy industry funded crap meant to make saturated fat look good. Anyway, there's so much more to cover here. I mean, even choline, which he exalts in this, turns into that TMAO and drives heart disease and a bunch of other negative animal components that he ignored and continues to ignore. Heme iron, heterocyclic amines, NEU5GC, endotoxins. How about the lack of antioxidants? I could go on forever. In the end, I have to once again reiterate that vegan diets aren't perfect and that when you're comparing two different populations, they're likely to have some things that are higher in one group, some things that are lower in the other group, but across the board, looking at the lower disease rates, again, like cancer, diabetes, and on and on in vegans, it seems that a vegan diet is working. Do we have things to learn? And yes, that is the, do vegans still have things to learn to perfect nutrition? Yes, but that is the case with all diets. I mean, the WHO just deemed red and processed meat carcinogenic in 2015. But of course he attacked vegan diets by using super old anecdotal evidence from Weston A. Price, which ignores modern dentistry, old B12 studies, which again, ignore the new studies that also use these sensitive methods, including one that he cited. He also tried to make things like vitamin D and digestive problems, some unique vegan issue when they are not. He tried to essentially erase the huge important role of plant foods in human history. And he used some ex-vegan anecdotes, completely ignoring, of course he was going to ignore the massive slew of positive vegan anecdotes out there. And perhaps most egregiously continues to deny the effects of saturated fat on LDL and heart disease are leading killer, which is really bad. And of course he doesn't believe in the 
companies anyway, but completely ignored the animal benefits and the environmental benefits of a plant-based diet. Whew, and I did not respond to all of his points. So if there's you know one or two points you think are really important for me to hit on, hit that down below in the comments. And then also, of course, you can feel free to click the link below if you wanna check out Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic and get that 15% off your first month's supply. You can seed it up and don't forget to use those jaw muscles to chew all that plant fiber starting at a young age to form your jaw properly. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, feel free to like and subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.